is that we do not normally link these megaliths and shaman with city builders. Indeed, there are no ancient cities associated with either Avebury or Stonehenge. If you mention megalith to anyone, these are normally the images that spring to mind, Avebury and Stonehenge. Oops. <coughs> and if they shaman, then this is what people normally think of. Much of what we talk about in our ancient um, past refers to nature, nature spirits, sacred groves of oak trees, landscape temples, energy lines, rocks and druids. We think of druids, we think of wild, elemental, powerful. We do not think of pharaohs, and nor do we think of cities. This is New York, obviously, and yet they are all linked. And one reason we do not make these associations is because of these people, the Romans. The Romans, along with the Greeks, um, were the most powerful of all the Indo-European tribes, and they continue to dominate us in the West. So much of what we understand about the ancient past is mediated through these people. It is filtered through their mindsets, their way of thinking, because we have inherited their languages. As well as giving us our access to the past, because we can learn about... We can learn about... Um, bother. I'm having trouble with this. <laughs> Um, it's got stuck again. <laughs> um, they also form a barrier. This is not responding. Oh, here it goes. Yeah, there we go. <coughs> Thanks. Yeah. This may sound bizarre, but the Greeks and the Romans themselves did not understand everything about the times they were living in. In fact, they were quite capable of getting it wrong. In particular, they did not understand these people, the Egyptians in spite of living with them for several hundreds of years. The Greeks of all the Indo-European tribes were those who were closest to the Egyptians, and it is mostly through the Greeks that we know as much as we do about ancient Egypt. But after the end of the 4th century AD, even that possibility disappeared, and we lost all ability to read hieroglyphs. And then so much about Egypt remained mysterious, a closed book. So what are these connections that have remained hidden for so long? To answer that question, I'm going to take us right back to the beginning, Back to the end of the Ice Age, more than 12,000 years ago, the dashed line on this map is, is the extent of the ice. This line here is the lower sea level, and the clans you can read about in my book. The Ice Age is when we tend to start the story of how civilization began, how we came to be modern, progressive people with all our urban comfort and sophistication, leaving behind that wild, woolly, elemental stuff. And the story that we tell ourselves is that it all began with a farming experiment. You can read about it in the British Museum. Paleolithic man, instead of sitting in his cave, begins to throw seeds around and finds he has a surplus of crop. And being clever, he decides to exchange it for something else. And so as primitive people, we're then on our way to becoming civilized with towns and cities growing out of early marketplaces. We could leave behind our hunter-gatherer cave-dwelling past and evolve into modern man, with the help of the Greeks and Romans, of course, and lots of people continue to believe that civilization only really starts with them. But unfortunately, we have been telling ourselves the wrong story. This is not what the prehistoric record shows. There was no farming experiment. The Natufians who were around from 12,500 BC onward cultivated wild seeds for 3,000 years, and there was no change from wild seed to a domesticated version. <clears throat> I have such trouble with this screen, I'm sorry about this. Um, and even when the change did occur, this keeps going to something else, which is really dull. <clears throat> the change did occur from wild to domesticated. It did not occur, it did not occur after 9,500. It's not plausible to suggest it was an evolutionary process. What we are talking about here, in terms of the difference between wild and domestic, is a difference of a single gene one that relates not to taste, but to convenience. Convenience being the hallmark of civilization. Here we have the shape of a barley seed, and it's, and it's what's called the ratchets. Um, these are the ratchets here, going up and down. And the ratchets are like little hinges. And what happens when the barley is ripe is that these ratchets break. And in the wild seed, this break 
happens immediately as soon as it is ripe. The difference between that and the domesticated version is the domestication version waits to be picked, and that's very, very significant. <clears throat> the chances of rare genetic mutant wild cereal turning into the domesticated one have been calculated at once or twice in two to four million seed heads. This is according to Gordon Hillman, who's cited by Steve Mithen, a well-respected prehistorian academic. For this change to have occurred naturally would take 20 to 30 cycles, i.e. 20 to 30 years. No one is going to realistically wait around that long for an experiment to work. They would return to trapping and say, Dad, you can forget your farming experiment. The obvious conclusion is that this change was deliberate. Someone knew how to interfere genetically with cereals. Another factor which is suspicious is where this change takes place. In South America, for example, um, one such place is Machu Picchu, high up in the Altiplano in the Andes, or on the upper Euphrates in the northern Syria and Turkey. Golden Crescent, now I shall be talking a lot about this. This map's gonna reoccur a lot. And the key thing to notice in this map is that this is all mountains. This is the Golden Crescent. We've got the tourist range here in Turkey, going around to the Zagros range in Iran. And this is, this is modern day Iraq, just so you can orientate yourselves. If farming really were the stimulus for, for the creation of civilization, why were the earliest examples of it located in such agriculturally diff difficult places? Jaquetta Hawks is one of the few who draw attention to this curious situation. That civilization was not inevitable, is what she says. For on the one hand, men have lived on well-watered and fertile land without creating civilization. And on the other hand, they have created civilizations in apparently poor environments. And she is not alone in her comments. Diana Kirkbride, a one-time director of the British School of Archaeology in Iraq, commented on one site that she excavated in the 1970s in the Mosul Sinjar region, which is around here, so well up in some horrible places that it was singularly uninviting, and this site dates to 7,500 BT, even allowing for change over time and degradation of habits. It's still, in modern times, not attractive. Likewise, Charles Mosul discussing another site dating to 6,000 BC to the east of Mosul in the Yarim Tepe up here. He also says that it's um, a zone of rocky hill limestone hillocks, not really suitable for farming, yet there is plentiful evidence of it here. It is also in the Golden Crescent that we have the remains of a series of well-built settlements dating to times between the 10th and 8th millennia BC. The most famous of these being at the end of the 8th millennium BC at Chatulhuic in Anatolia in southern Turkey. This is a reconstruction of it. And <coughs> sorry, I'm sure here, here we are. <coughs> It's something else that's held as mankind being on the way to a civilized life. But what is significant about Chatelhuic is that the central feature of the settlement are well-constructed storerooms which are better built than the human dwellings around them. They're right in the center of the place. And here, the diet of the inhabitants is resolutely Stone Age. It's not evolved into modern farming at all. It consisted of mostly wild animals, aurochs, and there's another contradiction of the idea that surpluses lead to towns and marketplaces and things like that. It's well laid out with all the houses having the same floor pattern and a proper street pattern. And it doesn't develop any further. None of this makes sense. And yet here in the Golden Crescent, we have the earliest evidence of farming, metalwork, pottery, not civilization as such, but the fingerprints of the civilizers. So what were they doing in the mountains? I will come back to this point later. And then suddenly around 5000 BC, in what is referred to as the Bronze Age, the first cities appear in southern Iraq, down here. This is where they first appear. About as far away as, from mountains as you can possibly get in that part of the world. And <clears throat> Uruk, for example, by 3500 BC was a great city with 10,000 people. We know these are cities. This is a very poor picture of the actual excavation. We know these are cities because they have recognizable infrastructure of a city and activities of things like 
administration and record keeping, skills that are not innate. Look at the difficulties we have with our own modern problems of teaching well-known civilized techniques like writing to know that even after thousands of years, they have to be retaught. And coincidentally, not just cities appear, but something happens in farming too. It's what the, the archaeologists call secondary products revolution. It is around this time that we can take milk from a cow, which means making cheese and butter, that's the secondary product, plough, ride a horse, take wool from a sheep, plant a vine, and so on. The kind of farming that we would all recognise. Before this point, it was not possible to take wool from a sheep, as they had coats like a deer, <coughs> even though there is evidence of a sheep, goat, ovary caprid having been eaten by humans as far back as 10,500 BC. How odd and how useful that just when lots of people start to live in cities, the production of food becomes more organised. This shift had to be deliberate because farming is not natural and no self-respecting hunter-gatherer would give up providing for himself and his family to live in a city unless he could be, until he could be sure that he had someone else to do food production and that he had a skill that would be useful in a city. In particular, farming had to be taught. Farming is not natural. If you think it is easy, try it. I've had a go and I haven't had a success. The hunter-gatherer was not used to staying in one place. He followed the herd. He was more used to killing than keeping stock alive, especially through the winter. Farming is a completely different skill set which requires knowledge of the soil and the calendar. What is also notable is that people did not make the transition first from nomadic hunter-gatherer to nomadic pastoralist. The shift to farming always involved a settled pattern first usually identified by the presence of pigs, which cannot be herded long distance. Take the example of the Fergana Valley in Central Asia, which is in the eastern part of Uzbekistan, famous today for its Kyrgyz tribes who come over the, the hills and, and mountains to move massive flocks of sheep over long distances. Even there, the Bronze Age pattern of farming, the Chus culture, which can be seen in the capital city museum in Tashkent, which I've seen, is still a settled pattern first. What this suggests to me is that the early farmers were not necessarily hunter-gatherers who took up farming because of some environmental change or other external pressure. What they were is actually different people with a different knowledge base. Even Julius Caesar knew that aurochs could not be domesticated. In any case, how would Neolithic man know what would make a good cow just from looking at them at water holes? I would argue that this change in farming happened because of cities and not the other way around. Not least as the first evidence of a city's existence wasn't a marketplace, but a shrine. Now, one of the oldest cities, which is Eridu, which is down here, in southern Mesopotamia, has a shrine dating to 2000 BC that has 17 layers underneath it that possibly go back as far as 5000 BC. Jaquetta Hawkes has commented on the fact that the key group of people who are involved in cities from the start are not the farmers, but priests. Now, by this stage of my talk, you may be wondering what all this has to do with megaliths and shaman. The connection lies in what these cities represent as a concept, a total concept of civilization, a concept in which megaliths and shaman were an integral part. Cities did not develop out of farming, but arrived as pre-planned artificial constructs on the landscape. They have identifiable characteristics that link them to a specific archetype, which includes the knowledge of how to move the big stones and has shamanic ritual at the heart of it. I refer to this archetype as the Ur concept of civilization. The Egyptians called it living in Mart, living in truth, the goddess Mart having the feather of truth. But I prefer Ur, which in this context doesn't just mean the famous city which Sir Leonard Woolley excavated in the 1920s in southern Iraq, which you can see lots of evidence of that in the British Museum. In my opinion, that is mistakenly identified as the biblical Ur of the Chaldees. I have good reason to think that that Ur of the Chaldees is somewhere else, another Ur. Ur in this context has the meaning of foundation, and as such can be found in names like Jerusalem, Yerushalem, foundation of peace. The best way to describe this Ur concept is with the help of a colour wheel plus white. 
And so you have organized farming, you have organized infrastructure, government, justice, weighing scales of justice lead to trade. So instead of booty, you have trade contracts. Trade involves moving of spices, that sort of thing. So sort of saffron yellow, which means you can have improved cooking. This is the art of cuisine. So you have organized bakeries, breweries, and this sort of thing you find in ancient Egypt. And for that, you need organized agriculture in the sense of arable. The key thing for growing arable is, is organized um, water management, ditches, irrigation, that kind of thing. And for that, you need to know what the calendar is going to be. So you request from the priests where you are in the calendar for sowing, reaping, that kind of stuff, what the weather's going to do. And then for the priests, they were had a very important thing in terms of teaching, passing on their skills and knowledge. And part of that skill and knowledge is uh, medicine. Hermes is actually one of the links between this, this thing and medicine. Well, that's also kind of linked with animals in, in a sort of therapeutic kind of way. So we have all the attributes of straightness, accuracy, precision, balance, design, infrastructure. And the important part of, of the circle, if anything is more important, is the temple which holds it together at the center. It was the priesthood who supervised the foundation of cities, the great engineering works, the monumental architecture, sanctioned the trading exchanges, predicted the weather, educated the young, kept written records, helped the dying on their way. They understood the importance of the soul, the psyche, and its role in reincarnation and immortality. <coughs> And they may even have been the ones who genetically adapted animals into the domesticated versions. There are also relationships across the circle, across the wheel. All forms of communication, trade, travel. Um, the individual body cared through food and medicine. And um, agriculture, this is obviously the agriculture line. And this is the line that is of most interest to us today, the power line which is the important relationship between the priesthood and the king, the Melchizedek. Melk meaning king and Zadok, Zed, Zedok meaning priest. This is the shamanic part. This is an archetype which exists for all time and in all places, which is why the same characteristics appear in the Near East as in the Indus Valley, in Phoenicia, Minoan and Crete, and in Central and Southern America, possibly the Far East, but I haven't explored that aspect. Egypt became the best example of it. Now, what is truly extraordinary about the Ur concept is the confirmation of aspects of it among people who themselves were not civilized and who can be found living a long way from the civilizers. They did not even live in cities. The people that I'm talking about are quite probably many of our European ancestors. These are the very early Indo-European tribes, long before they came to Europe. These are the proto-Indo-Europeans. The location of the original homeland of the Indo-Europeans before the fourth century, fourth millennium BC, is controversial. There is no universal agreement. My own personal view is that it was in the Pontic Caspian, Caspian in the Ukraine, which is up here. Now, the important thing about this, this is probably a line where they didn't necessarily come from further west. But this is an edge of a, of a form of weaving that's been found, which confirms that they were this, this side of of things. And as you can see, Mesopotamia is, is down here. <clears throat> and yet there is evidence obtainable from an analysis of proto-Indo-European language that shows that the civilizers came into contact with these early Indo-Europeans. What linguists have worked out is that we Indo-Europeans last lived together over 5,000 years ago, a time frame that relates to the, Indo to the Bronze Age civilizers. As I'm sure many of you are aware, there is an idea that the Indo-European tribes, Celts, Romans, Greeks, all lived together, Indians, Persians. How this was discovered was through the realization in the 19th century that Indian Sanskrit, although written in a different alphabet, has the same language roots as other European languages like French, Latin, or Greek. And what etymology, the study of this language, reveals is what kind of environment we knew, what kind of dwellings we had, what skills we had, and to a limited extent, what we thought. And in my opinion, certain concepts that relate to the Ur civilization archetype have been embedded in our language for more than 5,000 years, two and a half thousand years before we lived in cities. Contact with the civilizers is implied that we Indo-Europeans knew about bronze and about copper 
But we didn't know about tin. It doesn't appear in the early language. We suggest that we didn't know how to make bronze, but we knew how to get it. We also picked up from the civilizers over 5,000 years ago practical farming skills, and we could benefit from the secondary products revolution. In our early language, our Proto-Indo-European language, over 5,000 years ago, we have evidence of words of, to do with stock breeding, to do with sheep, cattle. These things can be reconstructed, as can puts the secondary products like butter and cheese. There is a very good reason why the civilizers should want to make contact with the early Indo-Europeans. There was a certain something that the Proto-Indo-Europeans had, which the civilizers were keen to exchange skills and ideas. It was this certain something that I think establishes these Proto-Indo-Europeans in a distinct time and place. And that certain something was the wild horse, the tarpan. Until the arrival of the civilizers, who knew how to genetically interfere with wild animals for the benefit of humans, the tarpan had been of little use to the Proto-Indo-Europeans. They just hunted them for meat and hides. The first domestic horse bones are usually claimed to be those dating from 5000 BC, found at the Derevka site in the Stredny Stog region of the Ukraine, which is up here. Stredny Stog, so there. And this is all the range of the tarpan, the wild horse. That's the significant part about it. The breakthrough in the exploitation of the deep steppe, which is this bit over here, didn't happen until 3500 BC. And the first wheel carts didn't appear on the northern steppes, on the north of the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea until 3000 BC. The civilizers would have brought horses down from the Ukraine. They would have brought them down through the Caucasus, down through here. And, but it was a little while before they make an obvious impact on Mesopotamia. By 2800 BC, 80% of Sumerians, which are the Mesopotamians, down here, lived in cities. They lived in cities then and had wheeled carts. This shift from wild to domestic horses had such an impact on the protein Europeans that they venerated the horse for thousands of years, attributing godlike powers to them. But their attitude to religion was generally very nature-based, very simple, sky earth, uh, sky god, sorry, earth mother. Um, the word creed can be reconstructed. It's two protein European words, kr and de, and it means put into your heart. One concept that particularly demonstrates the impact of the civilizers and is inexplicable to linguists is the reconstruction of king, spelt R-E-G. And this can be reconstructed to the earliest level of Proto-Indo-European, and it comes out as rex in Latin or raj in Indian, reich, recht. And this is a remarkable concept as it underpins the rules, regulation, accuracy aspect of the archetype. But at the time we learnt, as Indo-Europeans, this word, we were wild, warlike tribes living in mud huts where the central focus was the hearth. So linguists are forced to give to the ridiculous explanation that there must have been two kings, one for war and one for ruling. We clearly picked up a word that we did not understand the full meaning of. And then in about 3159 BC, the end of the fourth millennium, there was an appalling environmental catastrophe which resulted in a massive migration of all peoples, protein Europeans, civilizers, everybody. I mean, they go, they go this way, they go that way. The Celts go on to China and, um, and they go on to Ireland as far as you can go. And there's even an idea that the early Egyptians that we know about came from Mesopotamia and went down that way and came back in through the eastern, eastern desert. This is at this point that they split up into their individual tribes that we know about, and the civilizers had no further common impact on them, although bits of knowledge got stuck with individual tribes. Celts, for example, went the furthest. They ended up, I shall just go back to that one, because when they went to, when they went to China, um, don't laugh, you may already know about this, but 4,000-year-old ginger tall-haired, ginger-haired mummies wearing tartan have been found in the Chinese Taklamakan Desert. Um, it's true. Celts is the one who went furthest, um, retained the most archaisms and, were, and the most connections with Indians and Scythians and are possibly the most interesting. This is the example I was about to give of their possible retaining of knowledge of the civilizers, of their gods. The Celts continued to refer to Thoth as Tetartes, you can actually read about it in Asterix and Gaul. <laughs> One of the old names for, for Thoth, the Egyptian god of writing, you can see him in my slide here. 
when the Greeks and Romans had already changed him to Hermes and Mercury. The implication of this Celtic reference is it's possible that Egyptian deities could have been known to the Proto-Indo-Europeans -Europe before the start of Egypt. Impossible to know. The name Hermes in itself is worth noting, as at its root is possibly ur mes, ur being an alternative for that, and mes here. This obviously meaning foundation, and this is, um, comes out in Egyptian as son of. So uh, that's what the, another attribute um, of Fadoth could have been that. But in spite of the close proximity of the Proto-Indo-Europeans and civilizers, there's no obvious evidence that they knew about shamanism in order to access the metaphysical secrets of the original archetype, which is perhaps why they never built cities themselves until much later. I should perhaps now explain what I mean about shamanism and sh shaman or shaman, even though I'm sure many of you are very familiar with such concepts. In essence, a shaman or shaman is someone who has an out-of-body experience in which they undergo a journey as a spirit on behalf of a person or a community in order to find the answers to particular questions. The kind of shamanism that is practiced these days is often on behalf of a sick person or child so as to find out what remedies will cure the patient. It is important to understand that the information thus obtained is not discoverable through experimentation, which is how we in the West seem to discover everything we know, as it often involves the use of poisons that have to be treated in a particular way, otherwise they would be fatal. These shamanic journeys are trance-like and dangerous, frightening near-death experiences, and sometimes they can result in the actual death of the shaman. They are therefore to be avoided by anyone who is not properly trained or prepared, and it's one of the problems with modern drug takings. It can result in mental damage from ignorant use. The initiation or training of the shaman is, was critical from an early age. In addition, so was the preparation of the substance that brought on the trance, and that was key to the whole process. How this applies to the original archetype of civilization is that it was the role of the king to undertake the special journey on behalf of his people. In the case of Egypt, that person was the pharaoh, a title, interestingly enough, which could be a Greek corruption of the words per ul. Do you have this stuck now? Daniel? Oh, no, I'm okay. <laughs> which could be the corruption of the words. Okay, fine. Um, Per Ur, meaning the place where the Pharaoh's initiation took place. And that could have happened, Per Ur meaning house of foundation, and that could have happened here at Neken, or Hieranokonopolis, which is its Greek name, possibly in its mysterious fort, which had no defensive purpose. What the Pharaoh prepared for was a highly important festival, which only happened every 40 years, and is also referred to as the Pharaoh's Jubilee, and the Egyptians call it the Heb Sed Festival, which incorporated the Osirian rites a reenactment of the death of the god Osiris at the hand, and his revival at the hands of his wife, Isis. This festival took place in a purpose-built courtyard adjacent to a specially constructed pyramid. There were public aspects and secret aspects. Citizens from all over Egypt came to the festival, and the purpose of it was to rededicate the country to civilization. This is, this is the, the festival courtyard, and obviously this is the actual pyramid. In the public aspects, the pharaoh wore a special bull kilt and he had to run around his courtyard. He also participated in a ritual meal, which I shall come back to call the hetep. After this meal, the pharaoh disappeared into the secret part of the pyramid, of the festival, which took place inside the pyramid. Here he entered the realm of the deity Sokar. This is Sokar lying down here, obviously a pyramid. Sokar is interesting because of what he represents. He had a more complicated association with death than just being dead. He was part of a triple manifestation of the gods Tar, Sokar, Osiris. These gods represented the triple powers of animation, incarnation, and restoration, and thus were essential to the Egyptian ideas of the cycles of life and death, in terms of the soul being immortal and reincarnated in a living body. Writer Rosemary Clark describes Sokar as representing the latent spiritual principle within all living things, the spirit embedded in the deepest regions of matter that await arisal, a description which implies the beginning of life and not the end of it. Now, it is our cultural problem that we think of pyramids as tombs. Very few dead bodies have ever been found in them. The Egyptians buried their dead either in the royal tombs on the west bank of the Nile, opposite Luxor, or in mudbrick mastabas, the Egyptian word for pyramid is mur, M-R, which has the idea of an instrument for ascending. 
Another clue as to their function is to examine closely the structure of the most famous one, the Great Pyramid at Giza. Some quick statistics, it's vast, it's 13 acres, it's 2.3 million blocks on solid rock, it has an average weight of two tons per block, some of the blocks are 50 tons each, four corners are true 90 degree angles to within a hundredth of an inch, it is aligned on the cardinal points and only deviates by five degrees. I mean, an amazing thing, and for a long time it's one of the biggest things of man-made on the planet. What is remarkable, though, about this pyramid is it has been very clearly carefully constructed and very deliberately, and it is devoid of any kind of internal decoration or ornamentation, whereas the Mastaba tombs at Saqqara are beautifully decorated, the most exquisite bas-reliefs of life scenes that would help the pharaoh on his way in the afterlife. So not necessarily um, a burial chamber in the Great Pyramid. To take the most important of all the chambers in the Great Pyramid, the King's Chamber, an enormous effort was made to bring extraordinary granite slabs, megaliths, that weigh up, from 50, up to 50 tons, 500 miles from the quarry in Aswan, in upper, the Upper Nile. And then these slabs were used in the chamber in such a way that their function was clearly not visual. It's deliberately constructed so that its walls and its ceiling, I mean, the bit I'm talking about is this bit here. I'm afraid I've got a very good drawing of it. Um, but the ceiling here is not tied into the walls. It rests on outer walls. And then above that, the actual chamber, the chamber is sort of huge, it's sort of way down here, actually, and there's these things up here. And these massive granite um, things have chunks taken out of them. The reason for not tying the walls to the ceiling was so that they could vibrate freely. And the quartz in the granite has piezoelectric properties. So clearly a plausible explanation, the purpose of this chamber was to create an electrical field using vibration. And the gouges in the, in the beams above, which is all these bits here, these bits, would, had holes taken out so they could be fine-tuned to improve the resonances. One modern commentator, Christopher Dunn, who has a technical background, has worked out that the Egyptians knew about ultrasound and used it for carving and drilling, which is how he explains the amazing accuracy of Egyptian stonework and the fine carving on very hard stones like basalt and granite. And you can see in the British Museum beautiful examples of the tiny little vessels which have got very difficult access, but they're wonderfully carved inside. Five this importance. Okay. Oh, sorry. Oh, a bit far off five minutes. Um, I have to really speed up here. Um, anyway, the whole vibration thing. Um, and, the, and the pharaoh, he, he put on a special, he had, he had a special bed. This is his special bed. It's covered in gold. Before he went into the thing, he had a garment he put over his chest. And then he had this thing opening his mouth, the mouth opening ceremony. And these pyramid texts are really interesting because they, they give an impression that there was definitely a shamanic ritual going on. I'm going to rush you all this. The solar bread is part of the Hetep ritual meal, and this is the thing that's made from powdered gold. And this is a picture of the golden ram, which is an example from Mesopotamia of very pure gold. Hathor, the cow goddess, was the key connection between the two. Here she is as nurturer. And it's in her temple in Serabit el Khadim that the powder is found. If you look at her temple of Dendra, these strange electrical images in the, in the crypt. A Cosmic Serpent is a book by a, a modern writer who describes a shaman, modern shamanic experience in which he sees these giant snakes. And that's possibly a connection between Hermes and the Caduceus and all of this stuff going on. And, <clears throat> and this is the last temple on, on the um, island of Philae where... Um, the, the reason why we don't know any of this is because the Romans massacred the last priests on this, this island. And <clears throat> after the 4th century AD, when they were Romano-Christians, they'd um, become influenced by the Christian religion. <clears throat> and so that's why our whole knowledge of the thing um, came to an end, until the discovery of the Rosetta Stone. This is a drawing of Champollion, who helped to translate the Rosetta Stone in the 19th century. So for 1,500 years, we couldn't read hieroglyphs. <clears throat> and the whole thing, if anybody still says to you that, if I just have two more minutes, the whole reason that um, anybody says to you that there must have been masses of slaves moving lots of blocks of stone, just think of the Romans. They were the ultimate in slave society, and they still couldn't move megaliths. I put this um, picture up here because... This massive thing here is made of thousands of small bricks. That was the best the Romans could do, apart from some 
slightly larger dress stones. If you want to know more, because I've now run out of time, please do look at my book. Um, and I'm very happy to answer any questions um, as I'm around all weekend. Sorry I've had to rush this rather, but to keep to the time thing. So thank you all very much for listening to me. I hope you found that interesting. <laughs> Sorry about that.